He'll be on the congas later, and Keon will be on the bass. And up in tech today, we have Emily and Dave. Anybody else? <laughs> Christine. <laughs> um, so welcome. Just a little short orientation to our service, if this is the first time you've come today. You'll see some little pads in the pews. It's just a way to keep in touch so that we can uh, keep you informed about our events. And we are live streamed, so hi live streamers. We have uh, the bathrooms in this direction, and then after the service, if you go out that way, you'll also find our time of fellowship with coffee and snacks, and even for people who have food allergies. And we do the offering a little different here. Uh, guests are not expected to contribute, but if anyone wants to, the plates are up front and in the back, and you can put something in at any time during the service. So today I'm just going to start our theme of Ripples of Grace by recognizing some work that our children's program did. Um, the theme that they did two weeks ago was kindness, how it's contagious. So you can see how that those ripples go out from an initial act of kindness. And Emily Miller's up in tech, and she uh, made this little video with the kids um, after some words of Jesus and also some words of Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa said, kind words can be short and easy to speak, but their echoes are truly endless. Again, think about those ripples of grace going out from an, an initial act of kindness. So um, it's about a book called Because Amelia Smiled, where a little uh, girl smiles and it causes a ripple effect. And then a little later in the video, you'll see that the kids wrote cards to a young man they had never met who is struggling with cancer. So. Um, and then they have little connected people out of wrapping paper, so you can see how we're all connected. So enjoy this video that our, our uh, young people made, and then um, just after, wait, I'm sorry, I forgot the welcome song. Let's do the song of welcome first, and then we'll do the video. This is the day is our song of welcome. Uh, feel free to stand if you feel so moved. kids made. I got so excited about the video, I almost forgot to sing our song. So watch, watch the kindness video.
wonderful. And continuing with our theme of being all connected, um, we're going to sing a song called God Made from One Blood All the Families of Earth. And it will be on your screens, or if you want to look at the music, it's in the little black book, The Faith We Sing, at number 2170. Genesis, and we have three storytellers up here. The Native American traditions, um, some of them use a talking stick. Have you ever used this before, a talking piece? So that um, when you have a chance to tell a story around a circle, then one person has your attention because they're holding the stick. So whoever's holding the stick gets to talk. So um, <laughs> most of us have seen this because you're going to go that direction. So um, Grace is going to start uh, telling us about Joseph, and you also have to hold this other talking stick. <laughs> Here you go. Um, Joseph was a rather egotistical young man. He was the obvious favorite of his father, Jacob, which made his 11 brothers extremely upset. To make matters worse, Joseph boasted about two dreams he had. The first one, in which his brothers were all withering brown sheaves of corn and his stock was green and healthy in comparison. The next dream he described consisted of his family as stars, the sun, and the moon, and they were all bowing down to his star. Now the brothers were not too elated about the message of these dreams, but I don't blame them. If your brother told you that he was superior to you and would one day rise above everyone, how would you feel? On top of all that, their father gives Joseph a magnificent coat of many colors to mark the favorite. The brothers become even more jealous and cruel, and dishonorable events unfold. So what happens next, Melissa? Next. <laughs> Joseph's older brothers, like Grace said, suffered from baby brother syndrome, which I think is something anyone with a younger sibling can identify with. 
But the problem was that in this case, they really let the anger towards him fester until they decided to just go all the way and kill him and get rid of the problem once and for all. They decided that they would throw him into a well and take his coat back to his father so that they could cover up their own motivations and actions. They thought that by killing him, they would make sure that his dreams would never come true. But when it came down to it, Joseph's brothers had second thoughts. They did throw him into a well, alive, and they did take his coat back to his father, who was entirely heartbroken. But the twist was that before they went home, a traveling caravan of Ishmaelites on their way to Egypt happened to pass their location. They decided that this was the perfect compromise. If they sold their brother, they would definitely get rid of him forever in the faraway land of Egypt. And, as a nice bonus, they get some pocket money. <laughs> wow. Joseph's father was heartbroken, and he did believe that his son was gone forever. But, meanwhile, Joseph was continuing his life in Egypt, uh, serving Potiphar, the captain of the Pharaoh's guards. And now what happened, Gail? So, as Melissa said, um, Joseph was sold to the Pharaoh's chief officer. And while serving him, he did very well. And the chief officer made him the head of the household and put everything under Joseph's supervision. Well, Joseph was a handsome man, and the master's wife wanted him to pay more attention to her. <laughs> and so, but he refused. And so she went to her husband to tell him lies about Joseph. And the master was angry and threw Joseph in jail. But, so <laughs> but it won't surprise you to know that while in jail, the, the jail's commander put Joseph in charge of everything. And um, then that's, and he did very well with that. And while he was there, one of the pharaoh's former uh, wine stewards, who was now in jail with him, had a dream which Joseph interpreted and ended up that the, the, the wine steward was sent back to the, to the uh, pharaoh and started working for him again. Two years later, the pharaoh has a dream. Actually, it was two dreams. And he tried to get his wise people to interpret it, and they, they couldn't make any sense of it. So um, the wine steward heard about the dream and went to the pharaoh and said, hey, I, I know this guy in jail who can help you out with your dream. And so the pharaoh sent for Joseph and told him his dream. He said, in my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile, in front of, and in front of me, seven fattened and stout cows climbed up out of the Nile and grazed on the reeds. Just then, the seven other cows, weak and frail and thin, climbed up after them and ate the fattened cows. And so, they, they sw after they swallowed them whole, then I woke up. I went back to sleep again, and in this dream, there were seven full and healthy ears of grain growing on one stalk, and then another stalk had hard, thin ears of grain. And, they, and the, hard, the, the poor grain swallowed the, the good grain. That was like a nightmare. Well, Joseph knew what to say. He said, actually, you had one dream. God announced that what he told you what he's going to do. The seven healthy cow, cows are seven years, and the seven healthy ears of grain are seven years. The seven thin and frail cows climbed up after them are seven years, and the seven thin ears of grain scorched by the east wind are seven years of famine. Whoa. Just as I told the Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are now coming throughout the land of Egypt. After them, seven years of famine will appear, and all the abundance in the land of Egypt will be forgotten. 
So Joseph told him what to do. You should find an intelligent, wise man, <laughs> and give him with and and give him authority over the land of Egypt. Then your administrator will take one fifth of the grain of all the land of Egypt during the the seven years of abundance and store the grain under the Pharaoh's control. This food will be re reserved for the seven years of famine to follow in the land of Egypt. Well, it won't surprise you that the Pharaoh thought perhaps that Joseph should be this guy in charge and did put him in charge. Oh. And so Joseph went around the land and collected the grain and stored it. And yes, after seven years, the famine began. And whenever anyone came to the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh said, go to Joseph. He will tell you what to do. Joseph opened all the granaries and sold the grain to the, to the Egyptians. In the land of Egypt, the famine became more and more severe. Every country came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph. Thank you, gals. You did a great job. These are our family stories. Isn't it fun to tell family stories? Absolutely. So what happens next? I know some of you know the story and some of you don't, but we'll learn it pretty well today. Well, the great administrator of all Egypt, second in command only to Pharaoh Joseph himself, gets some visitors. Remember, it's year two of a great famine. No one has any grain, not even as far away as Palestine. So it's the only country that has any grain, stores of grain, uh, is Egypt. And that was, of course, because of Pharaoh's dream and Joseph's wise interpretation and wise administration. You know about the Ministry of Administration. It's very, very important. So they knew it was coming, so they put lots of grain in storage, as Gail said exactly for this time. And who comes to call but 10 of Joseph's brothers. Remember Joseph's brothers? Were they kind of in good relationship with him? Actually, no, they thought he had gone long ago and he probably was in their forgettery. Do you have a forgettery as well as a memory? I do. So here come these young men. Well, they're not so young anymore. And they are hungry. They're not exactly refugees. They actually have cash. And they're going to try to buy some grain from their long, long time enemy, Egypt, to take home to their father Jacob and their little brother Benjamin. Now, when Joseph sees them, of course, he recognizes them, but they don't know, have a clue as to who he is. He has grown up, he has an important position in the Egyptian state, he has an Egyptian name. He speaks to them through an interpreter. Why would they know who he is? He can understand what they're saying, but they don't know that. The last person that the brothers are thinking about right now is that little brother that they thought they had so conveniently uh, gotten rid of years ago by selling to those traders. He's kind of a distant memory, lost to them in the fog of years. So Joseph now faces a choice. He knows them but they don't know him. He can leave just that way, couldn't he? He could sell them some grain or not. Remember, there are two countries we're not exactly friends. He could throw them in prison for espionage. Or he can just accede to their wishes and send them on their way. All of us have choices in life, don't we? About how to think about the horrible things that have happened to us. Stuff happens to all of us, doesn't it? Hopefully not as bad as what happened to Joseph when his brother sold him to the Arab traders, but stuff happens. Maybe we're passed over for a deserved promotion. We're betrayed by a close friend or a family member. Some of us may have experienced abuse or neglect as children or may have be experienced abuse uh, by a spouse. Remember when we started this series on forgiveness a few weeks ago, remember that eight-hour slog through the swamp that I talked about? Some of us have been through that. Some of us maybe have experienced crippling depression or another illness. 
times of uncertainty when we didn't have a clue as to where to, to turn. Maybe some of us are there right now. Joseph must have had some kind of flashbacks, wouldn't he? Standing there looking at these brothers who had, the last time he saw them was from the bottom of a pit, looking up at them as they laughed and walked away. They treated him as so much trash. He knows he has some choices now. He has a good life now in Egypt. He doesn't have to go back there to his relationship with his brothers. He doesn't have to think about them ever again. He could slam the door in their face. He could lock them up. He could have his revenge. How shall we think about the bad stuff that has happened to us? What does Joseph do? Well, I'd like to say that he forgives them right there and then when they first show up, but he does make them pay just a little bit first. He's only human, and I'm not only talking about what he charges him for the grain that they buy. He does play with them a little bit. He tests them to see if they're really sincere, to see what they're made of. I guess you could probably count that as due diligence as the head of state or a rival hostile power, but it does go on for several chapters. He sends them back to Palestine twice, planting money and then his own silver cup in their bags to make them think that, uh, that he thinks they tried to steal the grain. He does, ca does cause them some distress, but they still don't get it. They still don't know who he is. So now we're ready to read our scripture for today, which is in your bulletin, Genesis 45. Joseph could no longer control himself in front of all his attendants, so he declared, everyone leave now. So no one stayed with him when he revealed his identity to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians and Pharaoh's household heard him. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph. Is my father really still alive? His brothers couldn't respond because they were terrified before him. Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me, and they moved closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold to Egypt. Now don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves that you sold me here. Actually, God sent me before you to save lives. We've already had two years of famine in the land, and there's five years left without planting or harvesting. God sent me before you to make sure you'd survive and to rescue your lives in this amazing way. You didn't send me here. It was God who made me a father to Pharaoh, master of his entire household, and ruler of the whole land, whole land of Egypt. Hurry! Go back to your father. Tell him this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me master over all of Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You may live in the land of Goshen, so you'll be near me, your children, your grandchildren, your flocks, your herds, and everyone with you. I will support you there, so you, your household, and everyone with you won't starve, since the famine will still last another five years. You and my brother Benjamin have seen with your own eyes that I'm speaking to you. Tell my father about my power in Egypt and about everything you've seen. Hurry, bring my father down. He threw his arms around his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his shoulder. He kissed all his brothers and wept, embracing them. After that, his brothers were finally able to talk to him. So here's where the story is coming to its same mind. And after a couple of chapters wrapping this up, the word forget appears for the very first time in Scripture. After the dad of all these guys, Jacob, dies, and the brothers become afraid, it's more that Joseph will still seek revenge. They don't quite get it that he's laid on that side. And Joseph forgives them because he sees that it is God who sent him to Egypt, not them, to save, save the lives of many people, to preserve life from famine. You can see that he chooses to forgive, not to exact the toll of vengeance that his brothers still fear after all these years. Now I'm not saying today that you need to forgive whomever called the bad stuff, 
cause the bad stuff to happen in your life. Only you can make the determination as to when and whether to forgive. Sometimes it takes the help of a licensed counselor to help you work through whatever it was you experienced when that bad stuff came into your life. And then you can, sometimes after you've worked that through with someone who has some training, and you can see more clearly what is the next people's step for healing. Sometimes that person has already passed on, and you can't speak with that person anymore. Sometimes you write a letter. Sometimes you go sit by the graveside and talk to them. There is healing. It takes a lot of work sometimes. But what I am saying, and what this long and important story in our family history of our spiritual ancestors is saying, is that we don't have to be defined by the worst things that have happened to us. That's the good news for this day, for this story. Of course we're shaped by them. We're shaped by every single thing that happens to us, aren't we? Every relationship, every experience, everything we take in through the media, everything that comes in those circles of family and, and friends and, and others, they all shape us. But we don't have to be defined by the worst stuff. What Joseph does, beginning here in chapter 45, which we just read, when he chooses to reveal himself to his brothers, remember, he didn't have to. And ending in chapter 50, when he formally forgives them, is that he chooses to reframe this whole difficult experience of his early life, being thrown in a pit by his own brothers, uh, terrifying journey to Egypt as a young person in a caravan, shackled and bound his years in prison. He reframes it all as grace. He sees God's hand in it all. He takes time to go back and reinterpret his whole life up to that point as grace. Even the bad parts had a purpose to bring him to this point where he could help not only his brothers, but so many others survive a terrible national and international catastrophe of famine. We've been referring to this unruly pile of sticks every week in Lent, the sad and representing the sad and challenging things that have happened to us, the insults and the injuries that we tend to collect, we can't help collecting, which we've endured from others or inflicted on others. Sin and all its various manifestations in our lives. And as I've been saying, sin is a real thing. People really do hurt each other, sometimes on purpose, but today we see that some of the, one of those sticks has been cast out upon the water. And ripples of grace are spreading out in concentric circles to reach the distant shore. Sin is a real thing, but forgiveness is also a real force in the universe. Thank you so much, Steve. A force that brings life out of death. When Joseph reveals himself to his brothers here in Genesis 45, it's a foreshadowing of Jesus' story of the prodigal son, isn't it? As the father says after the son's return, this is my son who is dead and is alive which is a foreshadowing itself of Jesus' own death and resurrection. The one who was lost is found. The one who was dead is alive. We have a little Easter here in these ripples of grace. Forgiveness and the reframe, the reinterpretation of our lives that, makes, that it makes possible are products of the power of the resurrection in our daily life. Do not be afraid, Joseph tells his brothers. Grace comes when what John Wesley would call prevenient grace has its way with us, when God acts in hidden ways in our lives, when we find the courage to reframe our past, when we, when we decide not to let the worst thing that ever happened to us define us, when we throw that crooked and damaging stick out into the pond, then ripples of grace will continue continue to extend from that courageous act out to the distant shore, touching not only our lives, but many others. Once the resurrection power of forgiveness is loosed on the world, who knows 
what new life will appear. Grace is always there for the asking. It's an unlimited supply. It will never run dry. There's a wideness in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea. So I don't know how you're doing on your, your earworm I'm trying to install there, but we're going to sing our Lenten song again. I'm trying to get this so stuck in your head that it'll come out when you're standing in the shower or you're sitting at a red light or whatever you're doing. I want you to think about this song called Love Will Hold Us Together. Kind of a band song, but uh, feel free to join in if you feel comfortable along the way. Paul, Paul come on up here and sing, please. <laughs> you don't have to stand up because we're going to... Oh, you can if you want. That's right. Stand up. You sing better standing up, don't you? Paul. together. Feel free to stay right here in your seat if you want, and others get up and walk around the room and greet others, and the peace of Christ be with all.
voice today. Okay, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm too lazy to do the stairs. Um, I'm here uh, one last Sunday this month to talk to you about March Mission Madness, which remember is not about picking our favorite basketball teams, but is a kind of good, uh, good intention, good spirited uh, competition between um, four for fundraising between four helping agencies here in Troy. And those helping agencies are TAUM, Joseph's House, and Unity House, who we've talked about the past three weeks. And our next agency and final agency that we're talking about is the YWCA, um, which of course stands for the Young Women's Christian Association. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with my slides up here. There it is. Sorry. You need a hand? <laughs> anyway. Um, you probably know the YWCA uh, mainly because of the housing services that they provide for women and children. Um, the YWCA does um, affordable rentals for uh, women uh, who need housing. Um, and they also offer, as we've heard um, with Unity House and Joseph's House, that they offer transitional housing services, either on-site or off-site, with services to help people maintain, um, maintain their housing. They also have a food pantry, uh, and that runs three, um, excuse me, that runs Monday through Thursday. And people who have an emergent need can go and pick up uh, three days' worth of food, which is nine meals, uh, to help, especially towards the end of the month when food stamps tend to run out. Um, they also offer a community meal one time a week on Thursday evenings from 6 to 7. Um, anyone is welcome, and uh, organizations such as our church um, do volunteer to cook the meals off-site, bring them to the YWCA, and then eat with the residents there. Average attendance is about 75 per week. They also have a program called My Sister's Closet, 
where people who are seeking jobs, women who are seeking jobs can um, find next to new professional clothing to help them uh, on their job interviews and to dress professionally once they get a job. And there's also, of course, casual clothing for women and children. They also offer what you may not know, a fitness center, which anyone can belong to for an annual membership fee of $30. And it's open every day from six in the morning till 10 in the evening. And I should say anyone, but now I'm wondering, it might only be women, sorry guys. <laughs> Another big service that the YWCA provides is training. It helps women get ready for work, it helps them get ready and learn the skills of how they're going to uh, manage school and get a degree. And as mentioned before, with the housing with services, it helps people with homelessness prevention in the first place, going to somebody out in the community who's at risk of homelessness and helping them learn the skills like budgeting that will help them keep their own apartment, keep their housing. And another big um, program that the YWCA's participate in is their stand against racism. You'll see their slogan is eliminating racism, empowering women. So they work hard for racial justice and to raise awareness of, um, of racial injustice. So I hope that you will consider donating to the YWCA if you have the means. If not, as with all the other organizations, they would appreciate your volunteer time. And announcement-wise, I just want to remind you that the culmination of our March Mission Madness is our big spaghetti dinner, which is held this coming Friday, only five days away, until Paul Morano's homemade sauce and delicious pasta, plus uh, spinach pie, rice balls, spinach balls, garlic bread, salad, and homemade desserts. Uh, all for the low price of $14 for adults, $8 for kids over age five, and free for those little ones under five. Remember, all of the profits go to the four helping agencies, and with each ticket you purchase, you get to vote for who you would, which agency you would like the uh, profits of your ticket to go to. You can buy tickets on the website. You can buy tickets today by seeing uh, me, who's running coffee hour. If you don't know who my disembodied voice is, you'll find me in coffee hour after <laughs> church. You can buy the tickets um, from me. Or you can just show up that evening. Um, the dinner starts at 5 o'clock. You can order takeout, and that starts at 4 o'clock, so you would want to arrive a little bit earlier for that. And the other announcements are in the bulletin. I do want to highlight, though, that the Tuesday and Wednesday night study groups will not be meeting this week, and that would give those people and anybody else lots of time to come out on Wednesday and Thursday night to help us with the pre-dinner uh, preparations, like taking huge tubes of ground beef and making them into delicious meatballs. <laughs> uh, if you have any questions, I'll see you in coffee hour. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. I do have one to add, which is uh, next Sunday at 8.30 in the morning. Um, anyone who's interested in just hearing more about Christchurch uh, can be, uh, it's called an inquirer's class. So if you're inquiring into membership or just hearing more about our ministries and missions, 8.30 a.m., next Sunday before church uh, here in the Wesley Hall. So for our prayers today, thank you, Christine. Uh, we're gonna start with a little song from the uh, Methodist hymnal. We sing two verses of forgive our sins as we forgive, and then Joel will do our prayers, and then we'll um, sing the other two verses. So feel free to stay seated. And this is a very prayerful time.
If you will join me in an attitude of prayer. Loving and forgiving God, you know the trials that are on our hearts. You know the things that have troubled us in the past. Those sticks that hurt. Those things that we cannot put down. Those burdens that you help us find a way through. Thank you for being there when we look and reminding us that you are ever present when we don't look. We know that we are stronger through you and that you have given us a gift in the ability to forgive others and to release the burdens of the pain that we've felt in the past. Hear the names that are in our hearts and on our minds, especially the prayers of those that are in need of healing, like Marge. Be with them in their moments and with us. Thank you, God for being with us always. And now if we will sing the third and fourth verse of forgive us our sins as we forgive. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And you can remain seated as we sing uh, Thank You, Lord, two times through. It's number 84 in the hymnal as the ushers bring the offerings forward. gifts to you to do your work. Use them as you will, as they are our gift to you to do what you see fit. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
our final song, for which you can stand if you feel so moved, is number 121 in the regular hymnal, or it'll be on your screens. There's wideness in God's mercy. May the blessing of God creating and redeeming the same be upon you and remain.